This is the sixth part in a course on the foundations of optimal brain performance. And we're looking to resolve everyday problems like anxiety and stress-related symptoms, sleep problems, mood problems and fatigue using the framework of functional medicine, which looks to address underlying imbalances in the functioning of body systems. And we're looking for the weak points or the places where we can make the most difference by offering extra support and especially nutritional support. So the brain relies on other body systems to meet its needs and non-optimal functioning in body systems often impacts the brain and in fact because brain function is so sensitive it's often the first place where problems show up. Of these key systems the gastrointestinal tract is one of the most critical to brain function. Problems like brain fog and fatigue can be the first sign of trouble outside of the brain. This is the key point. You may not feel any symptoms in the gut, like heartburn or bloating, but even so the gut may be the origin of your brain fog or fatigue. Why is gut health so important for brain function? Well to answer that, let's consider what the GI tract actually has to do. First it has to absorb nutrients, which will become the raw materials for brain function. Secondly, it has to block absorption of all the other contents of the gut because if they were to get into the bloodstream then they would be toxic or otherwise harmful to health. Now that includes toxic components of food such as pesticide residues but also partially digested or partially broken down food particles and also microorganisms and waste products that they produce. The secondary function of the GI tract is to keep the immune system in balance. The immune system's role is to defend the body against infectious and toxic agents. And since the gut is the part of the body where we're most commonly in contact with such agents, then the immune, the immune system needs to concentrate most of its resources there. And indeed about 70% of the immune system's cells are actually found in the gut lining. The immune system needs to be primed and responsive so that it responds effectively to harmful agents but not so sensitive that it reacts to harmless substances including food components and bed beneficial microorganisms. When the immune system gets out of balance you can have allergic responses which are reactions to harmless things or it can even attack your own cells as though they were, they were foreign agents. That's a process that can become autoimmune disease. There are two keys to how well the gut performs in all these functions. They are firstly barrier integrity or permeability and secondly the gut microflora and we'll take a look at each of these in turn. So first the idea of permeability. A healthy gut absorbs nutrients via two more or less independent routes. Firstly transcellular. This means nutrients are taken into the cells lining the gut and then pass out again at the other side and that's shown here in this schematic. On the other side the nutrients eventually pass into the bloodstream. The second route is called paracellular and involves nutrients passing through junctions between cells called tight junctions because that's just what they are. Paraless, paracellular absorption is still controlled and regulated in a way that for the most part means that nutrients come through and undesirable material doesn't come through. So that's what should happen in a healthy gut. But if the gut lining is unhealthy, so for example if there's some sort of low, low level inflammation or something like that, these roots can become compromised and unwanted material does pass through. That's shown in the schematic over here. The idea is that the green particles are nutrients and the bigger pink particles are not nutrients and they should be barred from absorption. It's easier to visualize at least the paracellular route going wrong because it's just a matter of the gaps opening up between the cells but the transcellular route can become dysregulated too. And this state of affairs is known technically as raised permeability or more informally as leaky gut syndrome. So again, increased permeability means that toxic material such as partially digested food can get into the bloodstream where it creates an increased load on the liver and the detoxification systems. And secondly, the immune system can react to the material 
and this may contribute to the system becoming imbalanced. For example, you may develop food intolerance as a consequence of leaky gut. It seems that the immune system can learn to recognize foods as potentially dangerous. A third problem is that substances can be absorbed that directly affect the brain in adverse ways. One example is gliadorphin, which is derived from, a, from the protein gluten, uh, gluten is contained in wheat mainly. Uh, gliadorphin is actually a fragment of gluten and it results from the partial digestion of gluten. Gliadorphin happens to be an exogenous opioid, meaning that it works in the brain like opium or morphine or, or heroin. Uh, and it's not the only exogenous opioid. Another one is casomorphin, which comes from the milk protein casein. So leaky gut can actually lead to you feeling kind of drugged, uh, but only after you've eaten the culpable food, such as a milk or a dairy product or a wheat product. Let's now turn to the importance of the gut flora, or the population of microorganisms living in the gut. Now you probably already know that there's a very large number of such organisms living in the gut, and a wide range of, range of species too. Some of them are beneficial, while others are pretty neutral, and again others are harmful. Probably the most important point to make here is that the makeup of the gut flora is key to the balance of the immune system, so we touched on this earlier. Immune system cells need exposure to healthy bugs in the gut in order to find a healthy balance for the immune system. And if the gut flora is unhealthy, or if there's an overpredominance of unhealthy species, then the immune system is prone to imbalance. One of the ways that healthy bacteria can benefit us is by making nutrients that we can then absorb and use, and the most obvious example is probably vitamin K. Bacteria can also digest some food components that we can't, and this can liberate nutrients that we can then absorb, which would otherwise be unavailable. Conversely, unhealthy microorganisms can produce toxic substances, which we can absorb, and they can also cause increased permeability. Now, a point about weight management. Research has shown that there are differences in the gut microflora of overweight people compared to slim people. Now, to an extent, we each have our own individual microflora, but we're talking about something more than that. Overweight people can show a consistent difference in the relative proportions of two groups of bacteria called Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes compared to slim people. And research suggests that this can be a significant causal factor for being overweight, or at least in animal models. In one study, researchers took the bacteria from obese mice and transplanted them into normal mice, which then became obese too, without any increase in their calorie intake. Studies in humans show that supplementing with prebiotics, which are in effect food for gut bacteria, actually affects appetite. So let's summarize so far. Problems with gastrointestinal health, and specifically increased permeability and dysbiosis, and dysbiosis just means having an unhealthy gut flora. So increased permeability and dysbiosis can affect brain function and give, give rise to problems like fatigue, low mood, anxiety, brain fog, etc. Even without any accompanying gastrointestinal symptoms like bloating and indigestion. But what exactly is it that can cause leaky gut and dysbiosis? Well, one of the first things that can happen is that stomach acid production can drop too low. You need stomach acid to break down proteins in food, and also the acid is your first defense against unhealthy microorganisms present in food. So a lack of stomach acid can lead to poor digestion and absorption, and subsequent nutrient deficiencies, and can also leave you open to infections. Now everyone knows what it's like to have a tummy bug, but you may not know that sometimes these infections can become chronic, even though the overt symptoms like diarrhea have gone. Gut parasites like Giardia can be like this, and are actually more common than, than most people think. Other infections are more of the nature of dysbiosis. One example is Helicobacter pylori. This is a bacteria associated with stomach ulcers, 
but it's thought that up to half the population is actually infected with H. pylori without any obvious signs of ill health. But that doesn't mean that it's not causing problems. It can suppress stomach acid production and contribute to increased gut permeability. Another example of an infection that's not really considered an infection is Candida albicans, a type of fungus commonly found in the gut uh, and it's thought to be harmless by many mainstream doctors. But overgrowth of Candida can contribute to leaky gut and increased toxic burden. Next, food intolerance. This can contribute to low level inflammation that can increase permeability and at the same time it can be a consequence of increased permeability so we have a complex set of conditions here. The most common food intolerance is to wheat or, or to gluten which is a component of wheat uh, and dairy foods are second in the list. Food intolerance can be a kind of allergy which involves a reaction of the immune system but it doesn't have to be. We've already mentioned that wheat and dairy can be sources of exogenous opioids that can affect the brain. But it seems that gluten can just increase gut permeability on its own. Antibiotics. Nowadays almost everybody has taken a course of antibiotics at some stage of their lives. And antibiotics are indiscriminate. They can kill healthy bacteria in the gut. And that can lead to permanent changes in the gut flora especially in cases of long-term antibiotic use. Poor diet and especially excessive sugar intake can cause problems by feeding unhealthy bacteria in the gut. Stress can affect gut health in multiple ways. Adrenal fatigue, which we've met earlier in the course, is often accompanied by a suppression of our first-line immune defense in the gut. That's a type of antibody called secretory immunoglobulin A. Slow transit time of food through the gut, technically known as poor motility, can cause problems because food actually has time to rot in the gut before it's digested and absorbed. SIBO is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. This is a variety of dysbiosis where bacteria, which should be mostly living in the large intestine, migrate upwards and overgrow in the small intestine. So what are the typical symptoms of these gut health problems? The most direct symptoms are things like bloating, heartburn, indigestion. By the way, it's worth saying that heartburn, which is caused by stomach acid coming up into the esophagus, is actually more commonly associated with the stomach contents being not acidic enough, rather than excessively acid as is commonly thought. Of course, it still is acidic to some degree, and it still burns the esophagus, and that, that's what causes the pain. Uh, and using medications that block acid production completely are going to alleviate the symptom. But hopefully by now you're starting to see that it may not be such a good idea in the long term. Other symptoms include diarrhea and constipation, and the kind of pain and discomfort associated with IBS. Constipation is worth an extra word because it's not always recognised for the problem that it is. The real problem is slow transit time of food through the gut. Now the, you might have a slow transit time but, but you still go every day so you don't recognise constipation, you don't recognise that you've got a problem. And if you do have a tendency to constipation or to, to hard compacted stools, hopefully you're beginning to see that it's more than just a mild inconvenience. So as I said earlier, you might have no real signs that you'd recognise as coming directly from the gut, but you can still have non-optimal functioning in the gut that can have a knock-on effect on the brain. So then you get these secondary symptoms that we're focusing on this course, so fatigue, brain fog, mood problems, anxiety, sleep problems, headaches, cravings and weight gain. All these things can be associated with, with gut health problems. I'd like to say something about communication between gut and brain because sometimes problems are the result of a breakdown in this communication. And messages go two ways. Earlier I mentioned that stress can cause gut problems. So when the brain perceives a threatening situation or a stressful situation it prepares the body for action. So that's the fight or flight response that we talked about earlier in the course. 
and and as part of that the body diverts its energy resources away from the gut so that digestion tends to be slowed down and secretions of stomach acid and digestive enzymes drop drop away the one part of the gut that might be an exception is the lower bowel which may decide it's better to evacuate its contents and that's why you can have the runs in stressful situations the vagus nerve is an important nerve that carries information two ways between body and brain on the brain's output side it carries the parasympathetic influence which as we saw back in unit 4 is associated with relaxation on the input side it's a pathway that that can carry information about gut health problems to the brain and provoke a response in the brain hormones are produced in the gut and affect the brain and we met some of these when we looked at appetite control and perhaps most importantly of all cytokines these are signaling molecules produced by immune system cells they can find their way to the brain and there they might provoke an inflammatory response in the brain uh, and we'll look at that in more detail later in unit 8 of the course so returning to functional medicine the model involves using lab tests to ask how well body systems are functioning and it's important to test gut health and gut function and there are several ways that you can get an indication of GI function organic acids are metabolic byproducts found in urine and organic acids can tell you quite a lot about the health of the gut flora and how well you're digesting and absorbing protein amino acids as we said earlier they come from protein in food and low levels can indicate protein digestion problems you can test amino acids in both blood and urine indican is a substance that when high suggests protein maldigestion or malabsorption and you can directly test stomach acid there's a very low cost method that involves swallowing a pill which is a, basically a bound up filament uh, and what you do is you hold one end of the filament as it goes down and unravels after a few minutes you can pull it back up and you can test the pH or acidity of the end that's been in the stomach uh, it's not to everyone's taste but it's really only mildly uncomfortable and it can give you some very useful information for, for a very low cost hair mineral analysis can give you an indirect impression of GI function sometimes you can see minerals that are generally low across the board and the most likely explanation is poor absorption and especially useful is phosphorus which you can only get from protein so a low level of phosphorus can indicate poor protein digestion how can you test if you have raised gut permeability or leaky gut well the simplest test is the lactulose mannitol test lactulose and mannitol are two inert sugars they aren't used by the body so they come straight out again in urine so what you do is you drink down a solution of the two and then you analyze which of them comes out again in urine because lactulose is a larger molecule it should be much less well absorbed than mannitol at least if the gut is healthy but the more permeable the gut the more lactulose will be absorbed so the test is looking for a relatively large amount in the urine or or again a relatively small amount of both suggests a problem with absorption secondly you can test for substances in the blood that are normally found in the gut one such substance is zonulin uh, it's a protein produced by the body uh, and it signals to the tight junctions between cells to open up so high levels of zonulin in blood suggests leaky gut another class of substances is lipopolysaccharides these are toxic molecules produced by bacteria in the gut and being quite large molecules they shouldn't really get across into the bloodstream so if you find them in the in the in the blood then it's suggesting leaky gut again now one possible problem with this kind of testing is that these substances may be unstable in the blood that is the levels rise and fall over relatively short spaces of time a test that gets around that problem has been developed by Cyrex a cutting-edge laboratory based in the US that looks at antibodies to these substances and antibodies are much more stable in the blood Cyrex also has what's probably the world's best test for gluten sensitivity. 
Lastly, I want to mention food intolerance tests, which look at antibodies for particular foods. Sometimes you find in these tests that lots of different foods are reactive, and it probably means that there's a high gut permeability. Should you avoid foods that come back positive on these tests? Well, in general, research shows that excluding foods can be helpful in reducing symptoms. But it's also fair to say that these tests are not entirely reliable. You can get both false positives and false negatives. Now, any gut permeability test suffers from the weakness that it's asking a fairly general or non-specific question. Even if it's positive, it doesn't tell you what's causing the raised permeability. Now tests that look at the health of the gut flora. Organic acids I've already mentioned, they are metabolic byproducts, some of which come from gut microbes. So they're produced in the gut and are absorbed and then are excreted again in urine. So for example, some organic acids can only be produced by yeasts such as candida. So high levels in urine suggest an overgrowth of yeasts. A stool test is the best way to look for parasites, but it's not necessarily foolproof because parasites are quite easily missed. SIBO, remember, is bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, and if it's present you need to take steps to kill off those bugs, so it's definitely a useful thing to know about. The standard SIBO test is actually a breath test, and the lab is looking for gases, methane and hydrogen, which are the product of bacteria in the gut. This kind of breath test is also probably the best way to detect H. pylori. Let's conclude by summarising what we've covered. Brain performance critically depends on the gastrointestinal system performing its roles of absorbing nutrients, blocking toxins and maintaining immune system balance. Two keys to gut health are barrier integrity or permeability and the gut microflora and these two have a major bearing on your toxic burden and immune system balance. Problems may not manifest directly as gastrointestinal symptoms but may show up as brain problems brain fog, fatigue, sleep problems, craving and weight gain etc. Lastly functional testing is worthwhile because it identifies causal factors for problems and opportunities for making the most difference.